Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. Today, we're doing part three of our C64 donation series where we're fixing up a C64 system to give to a young man with some special circumstances. Today, we're working on the star of the series, the Commodore 64. Now, this is just one I pulled out of my stash because the case looks pretty nice. It's not beat up. I have no idea what board type is in here but it is an 8-pin video connector. So it is a more modern one, but we will find out shortly when we crack into it what it is. So yeah. we'll get the cover off of it. We'll take some uh, voltage and resistance measurements to make sure it's okay to turn on. And then we'll see if it works or if it doesn't, and we'll get it cleaned up. Let's get started. You guys know the deal, what I've been talking about when working on these things. We want to measure the resistance on all the power rails to make sure nothing shorted out before we try to plug it in. And I'm using my standard power supply here, which I know is good for testing everything out. There we go. And we'll open this up slowly. And, oh, this is a newer one. Take off our power LED and our keyboard. Well, you know what? This is one I've had a part before. I used it when developing the case saver kits. I didn't realize that. It had this back one replaced already. But other than that, everything else looks original. Old heat sink compound and everything. Okay, so go ahead and get our shield off of here. There we go. Oh yeah, lots of schmaltz everywhere. Other than that, it looks okay. Power switch feels okay. Oh, we got another couple of screws here. Oh no, this one was missing a lot of. Oh no, they're in the. I was gonna say it's missing some of the motherboard screws, but those were in the heat shield. Doe, Jeffrey, you forgot what you just did. Okay. Got just the one split standoff in here. That's about the best bottom case I've seen in years. All right, that's good. Okie doke, we've got the multimeter set on ohms range. And the idea here is we've got five volts and nine volts AC coming into this board. And that nine volts AC is rectified into another five volt a supply and a 12 or 9 volt supply depending on the board revision and we want to make sure that all of those are okay there's no shorts on any of those rails before we try to power things on so we'll go from ground to the input side of this 5 volt regulator so we don't have anything shorted on the 9 volt input check on the output that's okay too Do the same on our 12 volts. This doesn't mean that they're going to be outputting the right voltage. It just means that it's probably safe to start. And we will pick one of our logic chips here. Check the 5 volt input. And that's okay. So we've got no shorts. So we should be safe now to go ahead and power this guy up. And see what it does or does not do. Let's do that. Okay, I've got our uh, video connector and power connector over here hooked up. So, the first thing I will do, I'll turn the power switch on here. 
And we will check to see if we have voltages. We've got a 10 volt input to the 5 volt regulator. Got 5 volts coming out, that's good. 20 volts into the 12 volt regulator. 12 volts out, that is good. And on our 5 volt rail, well, it's about 4.6 across the board, but that's probably not terrible. Let's measure at the let's measure the 5 volts coming in here. Yeah, it looks like we've got about two tints dropped across our switch and we have no video output. So the next step is we'll check for a clock signal being generated here and then look for bus activity. All right, we've got everything set up so you can see the oscilloscope and the board at the same time. Well, we should be on pin six here on the clock generation IC. Should be a clock output, one, two, three, three, four, five, six. We've got nothing, and pin eight. Should also be a clock output. So it looks like we have no clock. Referring to the service manual there, it looks like pins 12 and 15 should be the power input. So we have two, four, about five volts there. 13, 14, 15, and about five volts there. And our reset line on this is not hooked up to the clock generator in any way, so we should always have a clock signal. And we don't. Let's see if we can check the crystal. Go ahead and shut off our power. Okay, if we put our oscilloscope across this crystal, I've got it set down on 20 millivolts per division. We're going to get some noise. This isn't extremely meaningful as to exactly what the reading is. There's a slight reaction from it, perhaps. And if we try it with a new crystal, it's a little bit of a different signal, but then we don't have the capacitor and everything across it. What we're doing here is a very rough go, no go type of test. We're trying to discover if the crystal that's on the circuit board is most likely good or most likely bad. And here we're not seeing a significant difference between a new crystal and the crystal on the circuit board, which leads me to believe that the crystal on the board is fine. I'll link to the crystal power video uh, below, which I describe this procedure in more detail. The other thing it can be is the clock generation chip, um, which since it's socketed would not be too difficult to try swapping out. And I have one in a Commodore 128 right behind me, so we might do that first since that is quick and easy and we've got a known good one to swap it in there. And if that doesn't do it, then I'm going to swap out that crystal and we'll see what happens. Okay, I've got the 8701 o'clock generator from the Commodore 128 in this. And I will turn the power supply on. And... There we go, it comes up now. So indeed, the crystal is okay on this. We didn't see the big difference between a good crystal and the crystal on the board like we did with that Commodore 128. It's just that our clock generator chip was bad. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, keep this clock generator chip, the 8701 from the 128 in here till I can make a replacement for that Commodore 128. That way we can get this young man a working computer. Now it's booted up and it looks good, at least it looks as good as I can tell with not having my glasses on. Um, I've got the sit out of it. We don't need that right away for testing. So what we will do next is get the diagnostic harness out and plug it in and we'll see how it checks out. Okie doke, I have the diagnostic harness installed here. Now this was made from uh, Sven Peterson's design. Uh, he actually improved upon what Commodore originally did and took care of a little bug with it. Um, added some additional circuitry to take care of a problem 
uh, with a keyboard dongle, maybe giving you false readings. And you'll notice that I've got a really long keyboard dongle cable here. That's because this will also work with the new Commodore 128 keyboard dongle that Sven designed. So uh, you just need a different diagnostic cartridge and you can test Commodore 128s too. Well, let's get this fired up and see what the tests show. Okay, now we'll let this run through a few diagnostic cycles and see what it does. The video output looks really, really nice on this. Wow, even all the filters on this SID sounds good. Oh, that makes me very happy. Okay, I'm going to let this run some more and then we'll come back and get to working on it again. Oh, I've had this thing testing for about, oh, half an hour. It's on its 40th pass and it is passing with flying colors. So uh, what I'll do is get this shut down. We'll get the case cleaned up so it has time to dry overnight. And then we'll start cleaning the keyboard. And we'll go ahead and take this RF shield off the bottom of this board just to check everything out, clean up anything that needs cleaned up. We'll clean all this heat sink compound off of these chips. And then we'll be ready to start putting them back together. By now you guys know my cleaning regimen. A little dish soap, old toothbrush, melamine sponge or Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. Some hot water and some covers and some elbow grease. We'll give these a scrub, blow them off with the air compressor, and then we'll let them dry out overnight so we can get back this uh, tomorrow and get everything reassembled. Let's get going. Well, we've got the case halves all cleaned up and I blew them off with the air compressor. I'll set those aside to dry overnight. And now we've got our keyboard here. I'm going to use this keyboard or keycap removal tool that I got from Amazon. You can also get these from eBay. They're pretty inexpensive. It's one of the best things you'll ever buy for working on keyboards. Just slip it over the key, pull very gently and it'll pop right off there. And all these keycaps, I'm just going to throw in this bucket of hot soapy water. We'll let those soak for an hour or so. No need to get in an all fired hurry. And while those are soaking, we can clean up the rest of the keyboard. I find this sort of thing relaxing. I don't know why. It's like you can work on something and accomplish something and think of something different all at the same time. Got all the keycaps off of there, and this is a good example of why we want to clean keyboards. Look at all that schmaltz on there from years and years of use. All sorts of dead skin and yucky stuff. So I'll go blow that off with the air compressor, and then we'll finish taking it apart. Okay, I blew most of the crud off of there, and you'll see my row of springs laid out here. And one thing I want to point out you can see it, is that one of them is slightly longer. That is for the space bar. Just don't get those confused when you put it all back together because then you might have to pop off all the keycaps until you find it. Not that I've done that. On the back here, we've got about 142,000 screws and I've already desoldered the two wires here from the shift lock. And there are usually a few screws trapped by tape. That one we can just peel the tape back a little bit. And then I usually just take a little hobby knife and slip the tape around there. That way I don't have to try to peel the tape off. And then the rest is not real complicated. We'll just take all the screws out. And all of these screws are the same.
Okay, now I've got all the screws out. We can lift up the circuit board. Ah, the cord. This type of circuit board uses a carbon coating or the key plunger's contact. These are supposed to be black. Earlier ones had gold-plated contacts. Those can slightly tarnish over time, but you can clean that up with, say, a uh, rubbing lightly with a pencil eraser and then wiping with uh, some alcohol. On these, I'm just going to wipe these with a cloth with a little bit of alcohol on it to clean them off, and that'll be good enough. Okay, I've got a rag here. So it's like some old t-shirt material with some alcohol on it. I'm just going to gently wipe across here. And here we have the rest of our keyboard assembly. Yeah, it's got a bunch of these plungers, which are like this. Kind of T-shaped. It's just plastic, and it's got kind of a silicone rubber springy piece across here. And the black piece right here is actually conductive rubber. That's silicone rubber mixed with carbon black. So we need to dump all of these out of here so we can clean up this shell. Let's see if I can do this without making a big mess. Oh, well, not too bad. Okay. And thankfully, all of these are the same. Now we need to clean this guy up. Okay, I'm just going to go clean this in the sink like I did everything else, and then we'll turn our attention to all of those plungers. Got this all washed up in the sink and I blew it dry with the air compressor, but we'll set it aside with the case halves to dry. And now we need to worry about these keyboard plungers. What I'll do with each one of these is wipe them off with a Q-tip soaked in alcohol just to make sure they're clean. This is silicon rubber. The alcohol's not going to bother them at all. And then I've got a fixture I made up just to test the conductivity on these with. So I'll show you how that works. This part is not too complicated. We've got a Q-tip, some alcohol, and a load of plungers here. Let's wipe these off, and then work our way through the whole pile. Not very complicated at all. Something good to do when you're watching a YouTube video. Maybe. Hey, Bert. Well, we've got all our plungers cleaned up with some alcohol, and I got out my little testing fixture and we'll check each of these out. Now, this the reason for this testing fixture uh, will become apparent in a video in about another month or so uh, after I finish that up, so stay tuned for that. Okay, there are two sides to this fixture. One is for the Commodore 64 type key stems and the other is for the Amiga and Commodore 128 style. And it's very complicated to use. You set that down in there like that and you look at the resistance reading on your multimeter. Let me pan up to that. Okay, so here's our multimeter reading. This is on resistance. If I just set the switch down in there, you'll get something like this. And as you press it, it'll go down to, you know, 100, 200 ohms, which is perfectly fine. Now we'll just go through and test some more of them. And I would expect all of these to be okay. Okay, so we'll check all those, and then we'll wait for other pieces to dry. Hi, I'm just popping the rest of these plungers in here. I tested them all, and they're all fine. I didn't expect any of them to be bad. Most of the time they're fine, but it's a lot easier to check them before you put the keyboard back together. Okay, and then we've got our shift lock, which pops out of there like so. We need to pop it in there and then we'll put the PCB back on there. And that goes on there. And remember, counterclockwise till you feel it drop in the existing threads. And then clockwise. Just put a couple in there to hold it. And then I will finish them up solder these two connections here on for the shift block and then we'll get on to cleaning the keycaps 
Okay, we've got all our screws put back in. Now I'm gonna solder these two little leads here for the shift lock switch in. I'll get my roll of solder set over here. And we'll slip our wires up through the holes. A little fresh solder. Having just a little blob of solder on your tip will help transfer the heat. Well, we've got our bucket full of soapy water in the keycaps, which have been soaking for a couple hours. And I've got my little scrubbing toothbrush, so we'll go ahead and give all those a scrub. And then we'll let these dry overnight. The water loves sticking in all the little nooks and crannies in the keycaps, so it takes a while for them to dry out. It's not very difficult. You just give each one a light scrub. We'll rinse them off. Blow them dry with the air compressor, or you can just turn them upside down and let them set on a paper towel. We've let the keycaps sit overnight to make sure they're fully dry, and I've got them laid out in the correct order, I believe, and I also popped up a picture of the keyboard on my computer monitor over here. So now we'll proceed with putting this thing back together, which is not real difficult or real exciting, but it is nice to do after you've cleaned one up. Pop a spring on there. Yeah. That key is a little wonka doodle. I guess we'll fix that first. Okay, that was an easy fix. What had happened in the course of putting this back together, this plunger right here was slightly out of position and it wasn't free to move. So I just had to take about half a dozen screws loose on the back here. Didn't have to take the whole thing apart again. Let the board lift up a little bit, reseat that plunger. Everything was fine. So now we can proceed with our reassembly. And remember that our spacebar spring is different. I set it in the spacebar aside so I don't get it confused. And that does point that direction. There we go. This is all that's involved. Pop a spring on, then pop a key on. There we go. They do make kind of a snappy sound when you put them on there. They can go wild and crazy and do several springs at once. Okay, I'll get all these keys done, and we'll come back and look at the space bar last, because it's the trickiest. Here we have our space bar, kind of pre-assembled. And you notice that we want the bail on the front here, which is on this side of these plastic brackets. From the factory, there is the slightest hint of grease right there. right there just just barely any and then right on these points where the metal clips metal bail clips in there so again we're just going to give it a hint if you put too much on there it can get down in the keyboard and contaminate the conductive rubber so we just want the slightest hint of it and we're going to set this like this, make sure our bail is coming forward. And make sure we get snapped down on the post like that. This is much harder to do on camera. Ah, I lost the bail. There we go. We'll snap it into place. And we'll clean up any mess here that we made with a tiny, tiny dab of grease. Now the space bar works just fine. A little scratch right there, I guess. But it works fine. It's a well-loved space bar. I uh, also left off the shift lock key here to show you that it's different. It's the one that has the wire soldered on the back, it's a different type of switch. It's got its own built-in spring. So we'll put that on there now. Now, 
we have a complete keyboard and we'll get to work on the bottom case I guess. After getting the bottom cover cleaned up I noticed not just one of these PCB standoffs was cracked but most of them were which is actually pretty common and some of these back ones are rather stripped out. Uh, part of the problem is that the wall thickness wasn't sufficient and Commodore tended to use screws that were a little too long and they would bottom out in the holes. Uh, luckily I developed a repair kit for that and I'll show you the basics here and then link to the uh, repair kit video below. The basic idea here is that we need to remove all of the existing post and epoxy in some new ones that I CNC machine. Uh, the correct size drill bit is in the kit. What I like doing is going right through the existing hole all the way through. I know some people are gasping and shouting at me. Uh, it looks like the way the factory might have done it and it eliminates the problems of the original screws being too long. This makes lining it up uh, when installing them much, much easier. There's actually a divot in the bottom of these holes, which is where the drill bit will poke into. And of course I have a board under here, so I'm not drilling into my table. Now that we have those drilled out, I need to get some snippers here. I guess we can get rid of our sacrificial board. And we're just going to snip all these guys out. Put my thumb over there to keep the bits that we're cutting off from flying everywhere. Now I'm going to take some smaller cutters and get that as flush as I can. Okay. I'm going to take a little piece of sandpaper. I really want to sand these flush to the case and scuff up a little bit of the area around where the new post will go. Okay, I've got these all sanded and then I took one of my new mounts and slid across each hole to make sure it's nice and smooth and not bumpy. And then I also slightly sanded the bottom of these because uh, epoxy is a mechanical bond. So having those slight scratches in there gives it a little tooth to hold on to. And I also cleaned the mounts with some alcohol and I've let everything dry. And I've got the drill bit I used to drill out the holes, which fits through those holes. Then I also made sure it fit easily through the new standoffs, since we're going to be using it for alignment. And I've got my DEVCON plastic welder epoxy. I highly recommend this stuff. It sticks like crazy. Cut that little bar between the two sections because they never want to come out at the same rate otherwise. Something to mix it on. And I'll just use a screwdriver to mix it and to apply it. Then I'll wipe the screwdriver off before it cures. And we'll get these glued on here. I'll show you one or two and then I, I'll shut the camera off because I am really slow and somewhat messy with epoxy. And if I try to do it all on camera, it will be a real mess. So we just want equal amounts here. Okay. Got it mixed up. We'll apply a little poker uh, drill bit down through there. Make sure I don't have any epoxy on my fingers. Poke the drill bit down through the hole. Like that. We'll spin our post around. And pull that drill bit straight through. Now we have a perfectly aligned post. It's much easier if you drill the hole all the way through the case. And if you didn't know any better, it would look like it was from the factory that way. Okay, now I'm going to glue the rest of these on and we'll let it set until tomorrow. 
have the new standoffs in the bottom cover all epoxied in there. So we'll set that aside until tomorrow. And now I'm going to take a closer look at the circuit board. We know it works fine now. I want to pull this shield off the bottom and inspect all of the solder joints on the bottom, clean anything up that needs cleaned up. Then we'll solder it back on there. We'll clean up the contacts and uh, then we'll be all ready to reassemble it tomorrow. To take these shields off, you just need a soldering iron with suitable power and a nice wide chisel tip like that. Put a little solder on the iron so we have better thermal contact. We'll set it down on the tab and slip a screwdriver underneath there to convince it to bend up. That's all there is to it. This one is kind of tricky. It's in between these two connectors. This strap here is probably the worst. And it looks like at some point in time somebody should cut that. So we'll just solder it back on there when we're done. Wasn't difficult. Okay, now we set that aside. Take a look at the bottom of our board. Actually, this looks really nice. A few little dirty solder joints here and there from the factory where things were hand soldered. Have a look at it under my magnifier here just to be sure. There's one little freckle right here yeah this chip has been replaced one of the ram chips other than a little bit of flux and kind of a cold solder joint here it's okay since we're just doing a tiny bit of soldering i am going to leave my big tip on yeah i think whoever replaced the ram chips didn't have a very stout iron Led to some solder blobs. Okay, now I'm gonna just clean that up and clean up our contacts here. We'll put it all back together. A little alcohol. You can't just smear it around, you need to dab it up too. Otherwise, you're just smearing the mess around the board, you're not really getting rid of it. There's a lot of smulcher cleaning off there. You can tip the board up on edge and let it run off the edge like that. What I'm doing here is just cleaning up where a few things were hand soldered. Uh, this isn't strictly necessary. It just makes it look nicer. One big advantage to cleaning up all the joints that you hand solder on something like this is that sometimes you'll find a little fleck of solder that you'll break loose and it's better doing it then than letting it break itself use years later or months later. Okay, now we'll clean up the contacts on the card edge. Have a pencil eraser I clean. Let's give each one a few passes and I'll clean the eraser on my jeans again. I'm not putting much pressure down. I'm not trying to scrub the gold off of there, just get rid of any buildup. Got myself a fresh rag. Put a little alcohol in there, and then we'll just wipe off our Contacts on both sides. I already tried to clean all the old heat sink compound off of the ships. A 
and just get all of these as bent over in a position as we can. I know a lot of people like taking these shields off of here, but they were put on there for a reason from the factory. Again, a little solder on the iron. We'll heat up our tab. Use the pliers to kind of help guide it down into place. shields back on there and once our epoxy is cured up tomorrow we can put it all back together well it's been overnight and the epoxy on our new standoffs has had time to cure and I think the first thing I'll start with is putting some new feet on this case one of them was missing and a couple others weren't in too good a shape but I do have some new ones on hand there we go a new set of feet since the C64 has four feet, does that make it a quadruped? All right, we've got our fixed up and cleaned up board to go back in here. And got my screws. I saved in a little container here. Oh, there's the other two feet. Clean those up and save them for another case. And we'll find all the short screws in here, which are for the metal cover. Now, on some Commodore 64s, this, these screws are about half a millimeter too long, and they'll bottom out in these standoff holes and crack them. And on others, they used one longer screw for this back corner, because it also has to go through this metal plate. Some of them they didn't. You just want to make sure you don't get that mixed around. I clean this up. Made sure all the fingers were bent down enough to where they're going to contact the chips. And we can kind of test that there and see that'll work. That one's probably a little more than it needs to be. Okay. Now I'm going to apply the heat sink compound right here instead of on the chips because I can control where it goes right here. And that's the only place that you need it. And you need just a little bit. Okay, and I always wind up getting this stuff everywhere anyhow. Okie dokie. Get this guy flipped over here. Drop down into place. And get all our screws put back in. Yeah, we're going into new plastic here, so we'll have brand new threads, so we don't need to do the counterclockwise and then clockwise routine. Okay, I'll finish putting these screws in, and then I guess we'll put the uh, keyboard in the top case and put the rest of the way together. Okay, now we'll get the keyboard put back in the top case. Of course, that only fits in there one way. Yeah. In these two corners here, the plastic sticks up to kind of locate it. Now, on some Commodore 64 cases, the three screws to hold the top cover to the bottom cover are longer. Uh, on this particular one, the ones that hold the keyboard in place and the one that hold the two case halves together, they're all the same, so it doesn't matter. Just something else to watch out for. I also didn't realize till I was finishing up putting the board back in the bottom case that that thing was actually missing one of those little short screws so I had to go dig one out of my stash. This of course there's existing threads in here so we'll back that off till we hear it pop down into place. And then we'll snag that up. Now of course you don't want to 
tighten up every screw all the way at first. Trying to keep it in place and at an angle where you can see what I'm doing and I'm failing on both accounts. Okay. Here. Let's prop it up on a screwdriver. That way I can use both hands to do this since I seem to be klutzy today. Counterclockwise, it dropped down in the existing threads. And that's snug but not completely tight. And I just dropped one of these screws on the ground. Okay, well, we'll just do the rest of them. Okay, I've got all these started now, so I'll go ahead and tighten them the rest of the way up. Now we can marry the two case halves together. Now our bottom. And the top. on these rear clips it helps to guide everything into place because this back can bow a little bit with age and stuff may not want to line up like this let's have a look at that it turns out the problem was when I soldered that tab on that bottom heat shield back in place it had a little blob of solder on there and this plastic right where this web is is thicker so it actually rubs up against the circuit board at the end area you can actually see on the case the rubbing marks that have developed over the years so with that extra blob of solder it was pushing the plastic outward which was not allowing our case to close it's no big deal easy to take care of Correctly. And same deal with these. If I can pick up the right screwdriver counterclockwise. Alrighty, now we'll get this fired up and test it out. Do you see this? This is what it looks like when you drill the holes all the way through. It looks like most other products. Because most of them, they don't use blind holes like that. Okay, I'll get some cables hooked up to this guy and we'll see what it does. Okay, we've got our cables connected to our newly refurbished Commodore 64. And I think I'll uh, go ahead and try to load a game. Maybe... Um, I don't know. Maybe Shadow Switcher this time. Oh, I've got Shift Lock on. This is such a neat game. It's got kind of a load runner vibe to it.
Okay, I played Shadow Switcher for a while, and then I popped in my Easy Flash cartridge, and I'm going to go to my Diagnostic Collection, which I have stored under slot D. And then I will go to 64 Doctor, which I think this is the one that has the nice keyboard testing program in it. Yes. B to begin. And you see it'll put a mark under each one you hit. Okay, so it looks like our keyboard is completely functional. So that's good. I'm going to let this burn in for a while, play some more games, just let it run and make sure everything is okay. The C64 has been running continuously for two or three hours now. I've had it running demos, I've been playing games, and it's working great. This Commodore 64 turned out to be a good candidate for this refurbishment. The problem was simple. The black screen caused by the 8701 clock generation chip. We swapped in a good chip and it was back to working. We cleaned everything up, cleaned the keyboard, replaced the broken circuit board mounts in the bottom case, and it's just about as good as new. I think this will make this young man a very nice computer for many years into the future. Stay tuned for more videos in this C64 donation series, and then we'll do a wrap-up video to show the whole system as it will be delivered. Well, until next time, bye.